I am so glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. You know, we don't have very many guest speakers, and so actually there's probably a ton of people who come here who have never seen anyone speak at this church <laughs> other than me. And so one person that we try to have as often as we can is Alan Griffin. And so wow. this this is my friend and this is my brother. We have him for a number of reasons. Obviously, number one is, is because he's my friend and I think he's a great preacher. In fact, when Isaiah heard that we weren't gonna be here when you were preaching, he was like, what? What's the point of even having Uncle Alan if we're not going to be here for it? And so not only is Pastor Alan a great speaker, but he has a tremendous heart for a group of people who really most of the church has ignored for generations. And so he has an outreach to kids who are aging out of foster care. Just tell them real quick what that looks like. Well, the modern day orphan is a student who's about to what we call age out, someone who's 17 to 18 years old. Of course, at 18, the provision runs out. The state has no more they can do. And we say, listen, when the world says goodbye, we say hello. So good. We do 16 weeks of discipleship and life skills training. And when they complete that training and their goal setting, we give each student a well-running used car. Wow. So they can go to college and get jobs and of course come to church. Yeah. So we've given to that in the past, but today I, I want to just give fair warning that, that we're going to sow into this ministry again. And at the end of this message, we're going to take a special offering for wow. Accelerate, but not for Accelerate. We're going to take a special offering for those kids. Yes. And I want us to be able to put a face with that. So I know you're going to tell some stories. Absolutely. Our people are excited. The people who have been here are excited because they know it's unpredictable. They never know what you're going to do. So please try to keep all your clothes on for yes, this sir. whole message. But my friends, show your love. Give it up. Give a huge hand for my friend and my brother, the Reverend Alan L. Griffin. Good morning, Life Church. It's so good to be here with you this morning. Oh, how I wish Pastor was here, and I just love coming here and hanging out with them, but I really do. I think I'm using him to get to you because y'all are my favorite. Lean over to your neighbor and say, you're Al's favorite. But you didn't even know that. That just happened, y'all. But I'm excited to preach this morning, and so if you would, grab your Bible if you have it. Or your digital device, if you do not have a Bible, if you raise your hand, we will come to you and bring you a Bible. How about that? And not only that, you can keep it after we give it to you. So if you need one, just wave real quick. You don't even have to wave high. Just wave low. We'll hand you a Bible and you can follow along with us. We're going to go in the book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9. And if you would like to look at it on the screen, we'll put it there as well. 2 Samuel chapter 9, and we're going to start at verse 1. And uh, while you're looking that up, I did bring ministry material with me. In fact, I hid it back here. Um, I wanted you to get a hold. If you did not get it, get a hold of our book. It's called Undefeated. And you can grab it at the back. In fact, I'm going to, whoops, I'm going to run back there and sign as many as I can between services. But you can grab our book called Undefeated. And uh, I believe it's going to bless your life. I wrote it just a couple of years ago. And when I finished writing it, um, the publisher asked me, hey, wh wh how do you want us to promote this book? I said, listen, you just tell everyone it's about victory. I get really tired of just success books all the time. I want to know what it is to live in victory, and I want other people to know what it means to live in victory. Success is debatable, and success changes all the time. But when you live in victory, you'll be walking through the mall, and as you're walking through the mall, somebody who knew you before will go, uh-uh, that's not the Terrell I knew. The Terrell I knew was a low-down, dirty, rotten scoundrel. But look at him now. And you'll be able to look at your old friend and say, look what the Lord has done. I'm not what I used to be. It's all Jesus. He gave me victory. That kind of life doesn't come by accident. It comes by intention. So I wrote a book all about the intention of walking intentionally into victory in your life. You can get this book. Also, I have um, <laughs> a T-shirt now. I always use a male model for my t-shirt, but I don't use the regular sized male models. I use man sized male models. You will be my male model because you're handsome. That's right. Come up here. Get up here as quickly as you can. Woo! Come on, baby. That's my dog right there. I love you. What is your name? Matt. I know you, Matt. Okay. So Matt is going to model our brand new shirt just for you. It says, I'm God's favorite. I love that shirt. 
I love it because you know gold is the new black. <laughs> That's just weird. Okay. But on the back, it also says this, and so are you. Oh, yeah. You can wear that. Now, if you meet people, you don't like them, don't show them the back. Just don't show them the back. And I got that in man sizes. Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. I even got it in Spanish. That's right. It says, yo soy el favorito de Dios in the back. And then it says, y tú también. I love that. I want everyone to know in every language that not only did God choose us and he purchased our salvation, but that he chose them too. That he has a love affair with mankind and he refuses to do life without us. I love that. Lean over to your neighbor. Now you can say, you're God's favorite too. But you might want to say to him, but I look better. <laughs> Just throw that in. <laughs> I've also got some DVDs back there. I'm going to throw these out. In fact, I'm going to put them on the let people run. But I've got the State of Emergency series, which is all about winning the world to Christ. It's, it's devil tackling fuel. Everybody needs some. Sometimes you wake up, you're like, dude, I need a Holy Ghost vitamin. That's the one. You want to get that. And then I have a, a series back there all about the presence of God called Close Encounters and how to have an encounter with God at home. Some people wonder if God is with them when they're not here. How, how do you have God's presence among your children and just you at home? This series is all about it. In fact, when I open it up, everybody go, ooh, ah, ready, go. See, don't you want it already? And you can have these. If you are a man in here and you've been married for at least 10 years, you can run up here and take these. Run up here and take them. 10 years married. <laughs> yes. I can't match Pastor Sean's gifts last week. He gave away money. I was like, I ain't never seen a $100 bill either. That's incredible. <laughs> Let's go into the word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 9, we'll start at verse 1. The Bible says, now David said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. Everybody say Ziba. I didn't say Zima. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I said Ziba. So when they had called Ziba to David, the king said to him, are you Ziba? He answered and said, at your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may, may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who's lame in his feet. Verse 6. So now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, M Mephibosheth? And Mephibosheth answered, here is your servant. Verse 7, so David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of your Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Verse 13, so Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Father, I pray this morning that in the time that we have that you would supernaturally change us. Father, I pray not one of us would walk out of this room the way we came in, but we'd be transformed by the renewing of our mind in the word of God. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And all the party people said, oh, yeah. oh yeah. Man, I was reading this scripture and all I could think about was a party. You see, every week my mom would throw a party at our house on Sunday at lunchtime after church and because the party was so big every week she would have to prepare we would prepare on Saturday night some of y'all remember Saturday night you'd be at your house and we would cook and prepare and get ready because Sunday we didn't want to work too hard we want to come back from church especially black year church y'all because we'd be in there till two o'clock in the afternoon and we would run home, and the food would already be ready, so we'd be ready to eat. Except if you had fried chicken. If you had fried chicken, you got to fry that on the day that you eat it. We don't eat, do that soggy fried chicken stuff. And so we would rush home to eat at lunch. Well, my mom, on Saturday night, we had a tradition. Here was the tradition. My sister and I, we were the table setters. That was our role. And on Saturday night, we would set the table or add folding tables, the card table, any tables laying around. We would use them because my mom would always invite a bunch of complete and total strangers to our house to tell them about Jesus over lunch. That's the way it went at my house. That was the party. So on Saturday night, we'd ask my mom, Mom, how many place settings do you want us to put out? 
And my mom would think for a minute. And she'd go, hold on, I'll, I'll be right there. And, and she'd think for a minute. And then she'd give us a number. I want you to set 11 settings. Oh, 11 settings. We'd be like, 11 settings. Girl, he said 11. He said 11. She said 11. 11. We only had seven people in our family. So that means we were going to have four guests. Mom, who's coming? Mama, who's coming? Who's coming? My mom be like, don't worry about it. Now, 2,000 years later, I figured out she ain't know. <laughs> what my mom would do is walk around, and, and anywhere she went from Saturday to Sunday afternoon, she would invite strangers. It could be a hobo off the street. It could be a prostitute off the street. It could be uh, uh, anybody she meets, and she would invite them to come to our house for lunch. They would come and sit down, and by the time we finished lunch, they were saved. By the time we got to the dessert, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, and then we would dunk them in the bathtub upstairs. <laughs> Shoot. And, 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 man, I remember what my mom would do. She would, she would have us put on every seat a, a, a name card. It was a three-by-five card. It was like actually five-by-seven. We'd fold it in half, and we'd write a name on it. Why? Because my family has a spiritual gifting. It's called fighting. We would fight over where we sat. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? We fought over everything. We would fight. So she said, put the names, and our names are already on cards, and she put them at the spots on the table. And then there'd be four empty spots. And we'd say, Mom, what names do we write? And she'd be like, don't worry about it. I'll tell you later. We know she didn't know. The very next morning, right after church, my mom would jump in the car, grab us, throw us in the back of the wagon, and drive home. We'd race to the back door of the house, and she'd yell to us from her bedroom while she was freshening up, write these names, Terrence, Samantha, Jerry, and Connie. And I'd be like, Terrence, Samantha, how do you spell Samantha? Be led by the Spirit. <laughs> Sam, Antha. And, and I'd write them all down, and we'd put them on the table really fast. My mom would fix herself up, and then she'd straighten us up. She'd put us in a line and go, listen, if any of you act a fool when these people come over, I'm going to tell you right now, I will kill you. And I've got enough faith to raise you from the dead and kill you again. <laughs> now, when I go to that door, ding dong. When I go to that door, ding dong. When I go to that door, you better act right in the name of Jesus. When I open it, hello, my friends. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Bless his holy name. Speak with a British accent knowing she's from Kent County. <laughs> come in, my dears, my beloveds, my beloveds. Come in, come in. And they would come in, complete strangers. And they would come to the table. And my mom would say, look, we have a place for you at the table. And they'd come and they'd see their name and they'd sit down. And you could always hear this wonderful sigh. <sighs> As they looked and saw their name. And not only did they know where to sit, they knew that someone had been preparing for them. They knew that someone loved them enough to prepare something just for them. I want you to know that Jesus said that he goes to prepare a place for us. Not just a place so we know where to go. No, a place so that where he is, we can be as well. Our eternity is not a celebration of the freedom from earthly problems. Heaven is a celebration of the presence of the king. In this story in the Bible, we have the king of Israel. His name, David, brand new king. In fact, his army had just defeated the vestiges of Saul's reign. You know who Saul was. He was the first king of Israel. Mm -hmm. And God said, no, I don't want you to be king anymore. And he sent Samuel to anoint King David. David is anointed, but it's many years before David becomes king. In fact, during Saul's reign, David was serving Saul. Ooh, I could preach all day just about that. And Saul kept trying to kill him. That gives you hope right now because some of y'all at work and you think your boss trying to kill you. <laughs> think about it. Not too long from now, you'll be on top and he'll be dead. I'm just kidding. That's not true. That's not the lesson today. That's next week. And so Saul's armies were defeated, and Saul was defeated. In fact, the, the armies of David, who he told not to harm Saul or his family, had murdered, killed Saul and his family, including his best friend, Jonathan. And, and because of this, he was sorrowful, even though he was victorious. Wow, that'll preach. 
And, and as he's victorious, David asks two questions. And one of the ways, in fact, you need to read my book because one of the ways you know that you're living in victory is when you start to ask yourself these questions. Number one question, when you start to live in victory, what can I do more for God? What more can I do for God? Oh, man, I could talk all day about that. David wanted to do some things. In fact, he wanted to build God a temple. And God said, no, nah, man, you got too much blood on your hands. I, I want someone else to do it. In fact, have your son do it. Who, who was Solomon who built the temple? What did David do? He said, if I can't build it, I can prepare for it. And so he, he assembles so much gold and silver that it's unbelievable. Metric tons, six or seven metric tons of gold and silver. This guy was amazing preparing for his son to build a temple. What more can I do for God? You can't outgive God. Number two, he says this. What can I do more? For God's people. What more can I do for God's people? And so he says, is there anybody left of the house of Jonathan, the one whom I loved, the one the Bible says he loved more than he loved women? That's some love, y'all. I love my wife. I love her, man. We've been married 19 years. I love my wife. I love Pastor Sean. But there ain't no way in heaven or hell I love him more than I love my wife shoot devil is a liar so if you love somebody more than you love women that's some serious love and he loved him that much he says is there anybody left of that house that i may show him blessings he said there's one ziba said there's one and this is where the story gets really interesting because normally they would kill off the rest of the king's heirs of the former kingdom when a new king was in town but there was one alive. And Ziba, the servant, Ziba, whose name simply means strength and honor and a standard. He says there's one and he's lame in both his feet. Doesn't even tell us his name. Doesn't tell David his name. What he says to David is he's lame. Some of you in here already understand what I'm talking about because you yourself have had people talk to you just about your condition instead of your name. You ever had somebody call you by what you used to be instead of who you actually are? You ever had somebody talk about you by your infirmities, talk about you by your injuries, talk about you by your, your, your situations and your addictions more than you? Oh, remember, there's, there's, there's that dude over there. He's a, he's a, he was an alcoholic for so many years. He drank everything. Oh, there's that dude over there. He's a liar. He, he just lies all the time. And you haven't drunk in 15 years, and you quit being that lying fool 20 years ago. But they remember you by what you did, not who you are. If that's you, then, then you understand Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth understands you. Mephibosheth was lame, not by his own devices, but by other people's failings. Because he thought his life was, was, was to be terminated, Mephibosheth was in a place called Lodivar. Mm -hmm. Hiding out, hoping the king wouldn't kill him. And the Bible says, Ziba goes and gets him and brings him before the king. And he lays down on the ground, prostrates himself before David, worried that he's going to die at any moment. And the king says, do not fear. I read this and I'm like, what do you mean do not fear? Mephibosheth is in the worst position you could be in. At five years old, Mephibosheth, mom, dad, siblings were all killed by the army. At five years old, a nurse grabs him and is running with little Mephibosheth, trying to save his life. She's running, trying to save him, and she stumbles and falls and trips, and she drops the baby. Immediately, his legs are shattered, and he never walks again. He's crippled, dropped. You ever been dropped? You ever had somebody who's charged it to take care of you? Someone who's supposed to take care of you? Someone who's supposed to bless you? Someone who's supposed to be there for you and they drop you? You ever had somebody tell your greatest secrets? You ever had somebody expose the darkness of your past? Have you ever been dropped? You ever been abused or mistreated? Mephibosheth understands you. And now Mephibosheth is living in a place. I, I said before, a place of struggle, but let me explain. Lodivar means a place of no pasture. 
a place of no harvest. So this young man is shattered and broken, and now he's living in a place of no harvest, in, in isolation and desolation. And not only that, as I read the story, it says that he was renting a place there. He didn't even own the place he was living in. He was renting a place in the ghetto, trying to get things done on the first of the month. This dude was struggling. Hmm. I can tell you this. Our troubles will drive us to dark, dark and dry places. Our problems will drive us to a place where we can live in unforgiveness and never release the things that have happened to us in our past and find ourselves living in a place of no harvest, a place of no pasture. Have you ever felt trapped in your past? You ever felt like everything in you has changed but the world won't let you change hmm. so David sends a servant he sends Ziba Ziba travels from Jerusalem to Lodivar and when he gets there I guarantee you Mephibosheth was shaking in his little boots as he knocks at the door who is it Ziba! That means a standard. A standard is at the door. Wow. A standard is calling you. Strength and station are calling you. And I need to bring you to the king. And so Mephibosheth is shaking and he comes before the king. And the king says, yeah, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to bless you. Don't fear. And he says, well, what is your servant? That you should look upon such a dead dog as I. And David's response was transformative. He says, number one, do not fear. Oh, I could preach just that one line for like an hour. Because whenever the word says, do not fear, what it's really saying is, God loves you. Perfect love casts out all fear. Whenever in the word there's an angel or an angelic host or a, a prophet or an example of God walking around, they say, do not fear. What it means is, I love you. Because I don't come to harm. I come in peace. Number two, I will restore the land of your grandfather. I love that part. I love that part. If you come back with me to the king's house and you sit at the king's table, the king says this, I'll give you back everything you lost. I can keep going, but I'm not. Number three, Ziba and his servants, David says, I want you and your servants and your sons to work the land of Saul that I gave back to Mephibosheth, and you will give him all the money that comes from that land, all the provision that comes from that land. Not only did he get everything back that he lost, but now someone's going to work the land for him. By the way, there's something I noticed in there. Mephibosheth, when the new king came, ran for his life, afraid for himself. When you live in fear, that means you've lost love. Uh-huh. Mephibosheth runs this way. What does Ziba do? The servant, he, when the new king comes, he steps into the service of the king. So let's look over here. What does, Z, what does Mephibosheth have? Nothing. What does Ziba have? 15 sons and 20 servants. That's a lot of sons and servants. How did the servant get servants? That's what happens when you, sit, when you serve and you're faithful. See, his last name wasn't David's last name. His last name was Royal. He ends up with nothing because he was too afraid to serve. He decided, I'm going to serve no matter who it is. And his provision and his blessing was huge. I got to hurry up. David says this, you will eat at my table. In fact, in verse 11, he says, as for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. I've been spending about two years Studying the Bible in the perspective of the table. Everybody say the table. I've learned a lot about the table. I want to share it with you, okay? I've learned this. At the table in a, in a home of a Jew, every week on Shabbat, the table becomes a place of identity, creativity, and blessing. Every single week. And there's blessings that come with sitting at the table in that home because the father pronounces blessings over his family. I celebrated Shabbat in Jerusalem with some Orthodox Jews. They were, they were Messianic, but it was awesome because that brother got up and he sang 
his blessings. He sang his prayers. He sang a love song to his wife at the table with his kids and all these guests there. And I was like, you sly dog. You are the man. I mean, he's up there, isn't she lovely? I'm like, dang, bro. You are the, no wonder you got nine kids. <laughs> because the table is a powerful place. A powerful place. So when the king invited Mephibosheth to his table, he didn't just invite him normal invitation. He invited him as his son. Oh, man. Do you not catch the correlation here? I'm almost done preaching, and I want to tie this thing up for you real quick. Here's what you and I need to know. You and I need to know that God and David are synonymous in this story. And Ziba is Jesus. And Jesus goes looking for a broken down young man named Mephibosheth. And when he comes to the door, Mephibosheth's shaking in his boots. You know why? Because there's a new king in town. And he doesn't know if the king loves him or not. And when he stands before the king, or I should say lays before the king, the king says, do not fear. What does that mean? God loves. Do not fear. For I'm going to give you every, everything back you lost. And I'm going to provide for you. Don't worry. Yeah. And you shall eat at my table continually because you're my family I read that and it gave me hope you know why it gave me hope because it was Ziba that went to get Mephibosheth Mephibosheth was broken he was mistreated he was dogged out some of you know exactly how he feels in an economy that's bringing destruction in a situations of life that bring problems he didn't quit but he did get destroyed and here he is living in Lodivar a place of no pasture, a borrowed house. And there's no way, no way he could have lived up to his name, to Saul, to Jonathan, especially the standard. And so when the standard couldn't be upheld, let me explain. Ziba's name means a standard. The, 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 in fact, the, the word picture of Ziba's name is a flag. You know the American flag? We don't let it hit the, the flag must be up, upheld. The standard must be up. And so when, when, when Ziba went to the house, he said, you got to come with me. But Phil says, like, how am I going to do that? I can't even walk. Ziba said, that's okay. I'm the standard. And when I could not come to Jesus... When I couldn't walk on my own, he carried me. He's carrying us right now. And what I love is that Ziba didn't carry Mephibosheth one time and bring him to the house and the story's over. No, this story never ended. On Monday, three times a day, Ziba had to go get Mephibosheth and pick him up and bring him to the table. On Tuesday, he had to go get Mephibosheth and bring him to the table. On Wednesday, he had to go and get Mephibosheth and bring him to the table. On Thursday, he had to go and get Mephibosheth and bring him to the table. On Friday, he had to go and get Mephibosheth and bring him to the table. I'm so glad that when I couldn't live up to the standard on my own, the standard lifted me up and didn't expect perfection out of me. The standard helped me. The standard loved me. The standard served me. The standard is here, and his name is Jesus, and he'll pick you up, and he'll put you in the right place. Thank you. That's happened. That just happened. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Have you been dropped? Have you been mistreated? Do you find yourself in a place of no harvest? I want you to know that we serve a God who doesn't expect perfection out of you. He just wants your presence. And once you're there, he can change everything about you. He can make us new. He can make us what he needs us to be. And if you're too weak to stand, he'll pick you up. Can I pray for you?
Will you bow your heads for just a moment? Maybe you're here and you're thinking, Alan, I'm going through a difficult time right now. I need prayer. If that's you, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. And I'm just going to pray for you right where we are. Ready? One, two, three. Lift it up right now. Yep, I see hands all over. Once you put it up, you can put it right back down. Awesome. Maybe you're here right now and you're thinking, Alan, you know what? I need a relationship with Jesus. I want to start my journey with Jesus right now. If that's you, when I count to three, you say, man, I, I don't have a relationship with Christ, or I need a reboot. I've let things fall off. If that's you, when I count to three, I just want you to raise your hand. As soon as you put it up, you can put it right back down. Are you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Throw it up real fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you put it up, you can put it right back down. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Awesome. You're worth waiting for. Awesome. Awesome. Will you take your right hand? Everybody put it over your heart. We're going to say this prayer together. Here we go. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for picking me up when I didn't have the strength. I need your forgiveness to take the place of my mistakes. I confess my life is all yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I pray for my brothers and my sisters in this room. Lord, you said we can cast all of our problems on you because you yourself will take care of us. And Father, I pray that you'd strengthen my brothers and sisters. You'd equip them for victory. Father, we'd start to walk in the ways that the king would command because we sit at a table in relationship with you and we refuse to leave until you bless us. Father, I pray right now that you bless my brothers and sisters as they leave everywhere they go. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And all the party people said? <laughs> I know in just a moment you're going to get a chance to hear about what's next for you. And I also know that uh, Pastor Sean mentioned on the video that uh, we'd receive an, uh, a special offering for our orphan program. I just want you to know that you're investing into good soil. Lives are being changed. It's incredible. Um, I have a young lady right now that uh, her story just, it offends me. Can I be offended? I know everybody else in the world is, so I choose to be offended about sin and not about anything else. It's a beautiful young girl named Felicity, and uh, she applied to our program, and she's a brilliant young lady. And when I asked her her testimony, she told me that this was the problem. She said her mom and her dad were a hookup, and she was born as the result, and nobody wanted her around. Thrown into foster care when she was 12 years old, bounced around, abused, neglected, mistreated. When her mom went to prison for her drug addiction and the abuse that she'd done to her daughter, Felicity thought that she'd move in with her dad, but her dad didn't want her because, well, because she was mixed. You see, her dad was white and her mom was black. He said he couldn't have her in his world. I was offended by this until I realized her dad is living in Lodivar. And he needs Jesus just like I need Jesus. But today, I want you to know that Felicity is living for Jesus. That Felicity just got her graduation from high school. She was failing out at the beginning of our program in January. But... In May, she finished her GED, and she tested in her SATs so high that the University of Central Florida gave her a full-ride scholarship to their school. She, she scored so high that the University of Florida gave her one, too, and they want her to do what she's dreaming, which is to be a surgeon. She said she wants to put lives back together like God has put hers back together. Today, will you help us? Every dollar you give today doesn't make me fatter or sassier. But it goes to reach kids that need that hope in Christ. And so when you give today, if you want to sponsor a student, it costs $7,400 to sponsor one student through our program. It rocks their whole life. And my favorite part is every one of our students moves forward in their education, moves forward in their future because of mentorship and people like you that gave. Thank you for what you're about to do. God bless you. And I'll see you outside. I'm going to hug your neck with my sweaty hug. <laughs>